Okay, we are in Ecclesiastes chapter 2. Uh, we will pick it up in verse 12. Uh, just a reminder as we read through this book that until we get to chapter 12, where it says in verse 13, the conclusion, when all has been heard, is fear God and keep his commandments, because this applies to every per person. The reminder that we need to have and keep in front of us is that Solomon at times appears to have biblical uh, moments of clarity as he writes certain portions of this book. But for the most part, he has reshaped the image of God in his mind as he writes the book of Ecclesiastes. And we will see again uh, his philosophical approach uh, in the balance of chapter two, and we will sense in several verses his despair and his discouragement and his frustration, almost to the point of why bother throw in the towel. So let's take a look at verses 12 to 17 in our outline, and we begin. Let me just read the entire section, 12 to 17. Solomon says, So I turned to consider wisdom, madness, and folly. What he's saying here is that he is going to try to apply wisdom to the madness and folly of life that he is experiencing and that he has seen in other people and their actions. Uh, the wisdom here is not God's wisdom that he is trying to understand. The wisdom that he is using is his own reasoning, his own deduction, his mental acuity to try to understand madness and folly. He says, for what will the man do who will come after the king except what has already been done? So there's nothing new under the sun, Solomon is basically saying. What has been done by me, someone else will come along and do the same thing again. It might have a greater creativity to it. It might take on a different form or shape, but at its essence and its fundamentalism, it is the same. And I saw that wisdom excels folly uh, as light excels darkness. So he says, if I have to choose between folly and wisdom, I'll choose wisdom. If I have to choose between darkness and light, I'll choose light. But again, understand how he's using these terms. They're not from the highest point of view in the heavenlies with Jehovah. They are earth bound. So if you had to boil it down to a vernacular, I'll choose the better of the worst. I'll choose the better of the worst. Verse 14, the wise man's eyes are in his head, but the fool walks in darkness. And yet I know that one fate befalls them both. So a wise man will take a look at life through his rationale, through his reasoning ability. In church history, I think it was around the 
18th century, which would be the 1700s, it could have bled over into the early part of the 1800s. I don't believe it was. I think it was the 1700s, where it was called the Age of Enlightenment. <coughs> and what it was, was it was the uh, attack uh, between reason and faith. It was an attack upon the church by those who approach life merely through the intellect and merely through reasoning. And so he said, a man's eyes are in his head, but the fool walks in darkness. And yet I know that one fate befalls them both. And I said to myself, as is the fate of the fool, it will also befall me. Why then have I been extremely wise? So I said to myself, this too is vanity. Now, what is he referring to? He's, he's talking about wisdom, folly, and madness. Okay, remember, the wisdom is his human reasoning. Um, now, what he is referring to is the same fate that will come upon a wise person who views life simply through his reasoning will be the same fate that comes to the person who is involved in folly and madness. And that fate, faith, fate is death. Death will apply to both. So Solomon is saying, why bother? If death is the common denominator between a wise person and those who commit to hedonism, remember that word from last week, those who commit to pursuing pleasure and happiness as the end goal of life, if, if death is the common denominator, then why have I pursued all of these things? Why have I pursued the building projects and the vast orchard of trees and the irrigation system to keep those trees alive and all of the servants that I have in my household? Why it is of very little use he goes on to say in verse 16, for there is no lasting remembrance of the wise man as with the fool. Neither one is really going to be remembered for anything. Their memory is short lived. There will not be a ongoing remembrance of anything that they have done. Inasmuch as in the coming days, all will be forgotten and how the wise men, man and the fool alike die. So there's going to be no remembrance whether I was wise or whether I had a life committed to pleasure and the pursuit of, of happiness for myself at the expense of others. It's going to be short lived. And death is going to be the final cornerstone, the final tombstone, the final placard that will be hung on everybody. So what is his conclusion in verse 17? So I hated life. For the work which had, which had been done under the sun was grievous to me. As I look back on all that I've done, and if death is the final chapter of life, and there is going to be no real remembrance of anything that has been done, life is not worth living. I hate life. I hate my, what I have accomplished. It has been grievous. I have worked hard. And it's not going to produce anything lasting. He goes on to say, 
because everything is futility and chasing after wind. It's going to evaporate. It's going to disappear. It's going to turn to dust and ashes. There is a futility here in the way that I'm living my life. And in some senses, if Solomon could speak today, I think he might say, the way that I live my life and all of my projects that I accomplished. In fact, if you look at first Kings again, he was uh, the greatest king ever in Jerusalem uh, before or after uh, his reign. If, if, if that is the result of nothingness after my life, then in reality, my life, in the truest sense of understanding was really no different than someone who was involved with folly and with madness. Neither one of us have anything to show for, what, for, uh, for our lives. We have not accomplished God's purpose for our life. And why is that? Because we have eliminated God in our lives. We have walked our own pathway. We have traveled our own course. We have pursued our own direction. We acknowledge God, but God is not a part of any planning. Our purpose is from ourselves. And it's not to glorify God. Now Solomon's going to go one step deeper, one step further with this fatalistic approach that he has about life and all that he has accomplished. And it's, he's going to talk about his death and what is left behind and his concerns of leaving things behind to people who have never worked a day in their life. Let's take a look at it in verse 18. Thus I hated all the fruit of my labor for which I labored under the sun. If death is inevitable and I can't take it with me, You've never seen a U-Haul behind a hearse. If you can't take it with you, I must leave it to the man who will come after me. Now, if you stop and think of it, hopefully all of us have some type of last will and testament. Uh, that is a document that is in writing should be notarized with two or three witnesses, an executor of the will, someone who administrates the will and the details, whatever that will says, distribution of property and assets uh, to the survivors. Uh, Solomon is saying, I'm 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 not going to be able to take it with me. I, I'm going to wind up leaving it to someone else. All of my work, all of my effort, I wind up leaving it to somebody else. Look at verse 19. And who knows whether he will be a wise man or a fool? Yet he will have control over the fruit of my labor for which I have labored by acting wisely under the sun. This too is vanity. Now, let's back up here for a minute. He says, I don't know who is the inheritor, whether this person is going to be a wise person or a fool. My death is going to wind up giving this person control 
over all the fruit of my labor for which I have labored by acting wisely under the sun. I have been wise, according to his definition now, with how to go ahead and handle the blessings of God, even though I used them selfishly. And I'm going to die and I'm going to wind up or they're going to wind up being given to somebody else. And I don't know what this person is going to be like, whether they're going to be a wise man or a fool. Uh, and this seems like vanity, the emptiness. He goes on to say in verse 20, therefore, I completely despair of all the fruit of my labor for which I labored under the sun. If, if it's going to be given to someone who is going to be foolish, I'm laboring in vain. Now, who is writing Ecclesiastes? Solomon is, right? Solomon is, is writing the book of Ecclesiastes. Who is Solomon's son? Solomon's son is Rehoboam. Do you remember Rehoboam? Rehoboam was the heir apparent to the throne. Uh, back in the Old Testament, it was a general rule, father to son, father to son, father to son, uh, as far as inheriting the throne. And so Rehoboam would have, in, would have and did inherit the throne of his father Solomon. He inherited everything that Solomon uh, created, Solomon built. Solomon accumulated all of the houses and the vineyards and the servants, uh, the concubines, the wives, everything. And what do we know about Rehoboam? We don't know much about his upbringing, except if you read the first 10, nine chapters of Proverbs. Repeatedly, you hear Solomon say, uh, don't forsake the teaching of your mother or the instruction of your father. He says that at least three or four times in the first nine chapters of Proverbs, which seem to indicate that Rehoboam was not the most teachable or moldable son. Now, after Solomon dies, remember a guy by the name of Jeroboam. Jeroboam was a slave who served under Solomon. And Solomon, near the end of his life, became a tyrant. Uh, it was unbearable for Jeroboam and the other servants to stay within this realm of service to Solomon because of how difficult he was. And so Jeroboam left. He fled and he went north. And several of the tribes went with him. Those tribes are known as Israel, the 10 tribes to the north. Well, once he heard that Solomon had died, he returns. He returns down to Jerusalem and he has a uh, conference with Rehoboam, Solomon's son. This is where you get the Boams confused. And Jeroboam told Rehoboam, we will more, we will more than likely, now I'm phrasing that wrong. We want to come back and serve you. But we've got a couple of conditions. And the one condition is you need to lighten up. Your dad was just a hard nose and very difficult to please. And if you will lighten up, we will return. 
Well, if you read the story, Rehoboam, Solomon's son, confirmed with Solomon's advisors who were still living and said, what should I do? And they advised him to lighten up. They admitted that Solomon was a real hard nose. He consulted, the scriptures say, with his peers. And his peers said, in the vernacular here, you need to make a name for yourself. You need to clamp down even more than your father. And so in three days time, Jeroboam, the servant, came back to Rehoboam, the son, and said, what's your pleasure? And Rehoboam said, you thought my father was hard? I have more power in my little finger than my father does. And that's when the kingdom split. And Jeroboam led 10 of the tribes north. And the two tribes that stayed with Rehoboam were Judah and Benjamin. And so when you take a look at verse 19 and 20, Solomon might be predicting what is going to happen. It's not stated in those terms, but I really believe he knew the character of his son. There was no guarantee that Rehoboam would wisely continue the administration of God's work among God's people. Verse 21 says, when there is a man who has labored with wisdom, knowledge, and skill, then he gives his legacy to one who has not labored with them. This too is vanity and a great evil. Solomon says, I, I haven't been the best administrator of God's gifts to me. But I've tried to labor with wisdom, knowledge, and skill. And when I die, it's going to wind up going to my son here, who has not labored with any wisdom, knowledge, or skill. For what does a man get, verse 22, in all of his labor and in his striving with which he labors under the sun? Basically, if Solomon were to complete that sentence, all he gets is grief. Verse 23, because all of his days, his task is full and grievous. Even at night, his mind does not rest. This too is vanity. Solomon says, all of the labors... And remember, this is not under the S-O-N. This is under the S-U-N. Were painful and grievous. And even when he tried to sleep at night, he couldn't shut his mind off. It continued to run 100 miles an hour. And in verse 24, his conclusion is, eat, drink, and be merry. What else is there left to do? There is nothing better for a man than to eat and drink and tell himself that his labor is good. In light of this frustration, in light of working and understanding that I'm working to die, and then upon my death, it's all going to be given away to somebody who might be wise or who is probably a fool. Then I might as well just tell myself it's okay to have a hedonistic lifestyle, it's okay to pursue pleasure and happiness as the end goal because when death comes, it's all over with. 
he says, this also I have seen, that it is from the hand of God. Now, is he saying God is, per, God is giving his blessing upon this philosophy of life? No, he, I believe, simply is acknowledging that the sovereign hand of God is permitting him to pursue a meaningless life until he comes to the end of a sentence, comes to the end of himself. In Genesis chapter 6, it's recorded that God's spirit will not always strive with man's spirit. And so he's not saying God is blessing me here in my fatalistic approach to life. He's just saying God in his sovereignty is permitting me. He's not stepping in to correct me. He's going to allow the consequences of my decisions to correct me that God is permitting this. Verse 26 says, For to a person who is good in his sight, he has given wisdom, knowledge, and joy. While to the sinner, he has given the task of gathering and collecting so that he may give to one who is good in God's sight. This too is vanity and striving after wind. wind. So what I see in verse 26 is that God holds the scales of fairness. Solomon is saying that the sinner works and he gathers and he collects, but at the end, it's going to be given to someone who God determines as righteous. One whom God says is good in his sight. So God holds the scales of fairness. So as we wrap up chapter 2, Solomon plainly speaks of and records his philosophy of a life apart from God, one of fatalism, one of defeat. But there's a verse I did not read. And it, it's the key to someone whose life is empty and the pursuit of things that they believe will give them happiness and joy that leave them empty. This is the key to change that. And it's verse 25. Who can eat and who can have enjoyment without him? In the midst of Solomon's frustration and fatalism, the Spirit of God records this one, in this chapter, this one biblical clear, moment of clarity. In Solomon's life, who can eat and who can have enjoyment without him? Remember, this comes on the heels of verse 24 that says, you know, I'm going to die. Everything is going to be given to somebody else. I have no control over that. Then I might as well eat, drink, and be merry because at the end, I'm not going to be remembered. It doesn't matter. I might as well enjoy life now. And then this verse comes in. There should be a but there, but the Spirit of God did not put that in there. Who can eat and who can have enjoyment without God? And it's a rhetorical question that the Spirit of God does not motivate Solomon to answer. And the answer is not found until chapter 12, verse 13. 
and that is to obey the commandments of God and to serve him. Apart from him, there is no purpose. There is no meaning. There is no significance of life. I don't care what psychology tells you. I don't care what the medical community tells you. I don't care what our government tells us. I don't care about any other authority than what the Word of God has to say. And the Word of God says, we move and have our very being in Him. It's that relationship with Him that regardless of my circumstances, regardless of your feelings, I can find enjoyment in him. I can find joy, peace, contentment in him because he is the only factor that does not change, that does not waver. He is consistent. He is sure. He is steady. He is the rock upon which the Christian must stand upon that when the waves and the wind of doubt assail us and beat on us and try to knock us off. And when the dust settles according to Ephesians chapter 6, we will remain standing. We will remain standing. Questions, thoughts? shake your head you just depressed us to death <laughs> yeah it is depressing well it's it's right up the alley where the contemporary christian church is today yeah. and oh, no. the vast majority of christians as well Bible is not always meant to make you happy. <laughs> okay. Nope. Part of the design of the word of God is according to Timothy to teach us and to correct us and reprove us and to train us. Yes. All right. Thursday, we wrap up on the minor prophets. If we were in Chicago, I would tell you we would be studying the last book of the Bible called Malachi, but it's Malachi. <laughs> Malachi, oh, it's one of my favorite Old Testament prophetic books. Um, it's probably going to be a little bit of a downer, but it speaks to the religious, it speaks to the spiritual leaders today in uh, the contemporary Christian church. Uh, it addresses the attitude of the spiritual leaders. Uh, if you want to read through it, count how many times God refers to himself as the Lord of hosts. And then exactly what does that title mean? Sunday, Hebrews chapter 11, the first three verses, verses 1, 2, and 3. And then Sunday night, we will begin a two-part series on eating disorders, helping teens and adults navigate 
the cultural norms and we will be focusing in on anorexia nervosa. And so that will be a very interesting study, I hope. Saturday, five o'clock, or is it six o'clock? When, what time is the dinner? Five o'clock, five o'clock. So if you are bringing something, be down there by 4.30. Uh, it's gonna be a great time. We're, I think we're anticipating 35 to 40 people. And of course, when a church gets together for food, there are always lots of people that come out looking for food. I would not be surprised if Robert Mapes is not there Saturday uh, for the Thanksgiving harvest dinner. Uh, other than that, I think the Lord I, I think the Lord continues to go before us. Uh, watch out for the shoelaces that I've mentioned to you before. Um, continue to pray for Annette's dad. Uh, remember our seniors, the weather is turning. And uh, I have not seen, uh, and I've talked a couple of times with, but she just does not feel comfortable coming out. And of course, that's Eileen Geringer. And uh, when Dave and Debbie are not up there, there's not, uh, the other children try to check in with her, uh, but they're working. You know, Dave and Debbie are right there on the property. So let's remember our seniors, uh, Carl Howell over there in Tawanda as well. Uh, and now with Julie being up there in Tunkhannock. So we've got some wonderful things to be thanking the Lord for and continue to persevere in prayer. The watchword for this week is stand firm. That's the watchword for this coming week, this coming week, stand firm. All right.